And it's just a few minutes past uh, 2 o'clock local time here in Helsinki, Finland. I want to welcome everybody to our uh, international webinar. Um, the title and topic today is Going International with Inbound uh, Marketing. And uh, this is a panel format, so welcome everybody. I think it's going to be an exciting one. Uh, in this webinar, we'll be discussing the challenges of going international. We'll, we'll be looking at uh, what inbound means in particular. And uh, we hope to offer some real-life uh, business examples from professionals who are actually working in international sales and marketing um, and trying to conquer new markets um, using a variety of techniques, both outbound and, and inbound. And we'll show you some insight also on uh, what going international means uh, using the internet and relying a bit less maybe on some of the more traditional approaches. My name is Tommy Uriela. I'm founding partner at Alton and Uriela Sales Communications. We were a company that was set up in 2012. We're an inbound marketing agency and a value-added reseller for uh, HubSpot. And we're based in, in Helsinki, Finland. Our panelists today, Mr. Jukka Hieta is with me. Hi, hi Jukka. Hi, Tommy. How are you doing? Good, 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 thanks. Uh, very briefly, tell us a little bit about uh, what you do and uh, what you, who you work for. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm, I'm heading sales and marketing at uh, Nordic ID. We do RFID readers and uh, software. Finnish-based company headquartered in uh, Salo. Turnover this fiscal is about 9.5 million euros and, and we are, posit uh, we are on positive, uh, positive uh, numbers. Uh, blue numbers and uh, I'm, I'm very glad to be in this RFID business because this is predicted to grow 15% every year between 2015-2020 and, and we can see it of course in our sales funnel and uh, also in, in marketing activities. I used to work for Nokia, Tieto, Arisent and, uh, and uh, Sofor which is a Finnish, Finnish uh, software IT services company. We ha also have Sharon Murnahan who is the principal level three channel account manager for HubSpot International. Uh, Sharon, can you hear us? I can hear you loud and clear. Dublin, Dublin checking in. Dublin calling, thank you. Uh, Sharon, just very briefly, um, a few words on yourself, what you do, and, and uh, maybe a few words on HubSpot, HubSpot also. Sure, sure. Listen, Tommy, thank you very much for inviting me to attend, and I'm delighted to be virtually speaking to this group. So um, what do I do? I'm, as Tommy says, I'm a principal level three channel account manager based here in Dublin in Ireland with HubSpot. I've worked in the, the media industry in a sales perspective for the guts of plus 20 years. Uh, traditional media, print media, newspapers, yellow pages. And then I discovered that, you know, there was a, an end in sight for that level of it, that type of industry. And it was time to move on into the digital world. Discovered HubSpot, who are the inbound marketing global leader. And I've been working here for the last three years. And what I do primarily is I work with um, small to medium business owners and marketing agencies to help them grow by achieving predictable, measurable and improvable ROI from the marketing ad and advertising services that they deliver to their clients. So I was part of the team that first opened the international office here in Dublin and we've grown it from zero to now 175. So it is an industry that is growing. It is a huge opportunity on the global stage. It is a huge opportunity for taking your business out of the local market if that's what you want to do. And as the seminar's title suggests, is really going international with your business. HubSpot is a great example of, of going international. Um, just go back a little bit, uh, Sharon, there. How many years has it taken HubSpot to, to get to where it is today? Tommy, HubSpot was founded eight years ago in, um, in Boston as a consequence of a blog post that was put out by the two initial founders, uh, Brian Halligan and Dharmesh Shah. And the title or the subject matter of the blog post was about how marketing has changed and how the industry and people were shopping had changed as well, that they were no longer looking for people uh, or to push their message out. They were more looking for people who were interested in solving their problems. How HubSpot has, has grown internationally and how HubSpot has really established itself on the global stage is by working with partners like yourselves in your local marketplace where you understand the language, you understand the culture, you understand the challenges and the pain points of your local market and you also understand how it is to operate on a global stage and on an international stage so that you can take that knowledge and work with clients to help them expand their message internationally. 
Fantastic, thanks. So let's get into the uh, topic of the webinar, Going International with Inbound. But starting off a few words, I know a lot of our uh, attendees in this webinar have been uh, have joined us before and they've gotten a good, some good info on, on what inbound means. Um, just a very quick recap of how buying has changed. And pe please feel free to join me, Sharon, on this one. I think uh, this comes from HubSpot. About 60 to 90 percent of the purchase decision has been made before a rep even talks to um, or, a, or a customer even talks to a sales rep. And that actually, so, you know, we obviously have to ask the question, where are these people? And they are on the on the Internet. And uh, here's a HubSpot slide. I know that Sharon knows this. Think about it. Pre-Internet, the buyer was relatively uninformed. The role of the salesman was very different. Uh, the buyer journey was very linear. And the marketing playbook was uh, what we call interruptive. So we were doing a lot of cold calls and, and advertising. Um, and today, it's it's changed. We're looking at uh, very well-informed buyers. Uh, Google is where the buyer journey starts, and the marketing content, uh, marketing playbook, sorry, uh, goes is based on content marketing and thought leadership. So it's a very different landscape. And what we're essentially doing right now is is in this day and age, we're moving from a seller-centric uh, position to a very buyer-centric position. That has huge ramifications for for companies that are thinking of. Of moving on into new markets because what may still work, um, for example, the traditional approach in your market uh, may not actually work as you move and expand into into new markets. Sharon, a few words on this slide. I think you you've got it covered. <laughs> because um, my own background was Yellow Pages, um, and it's so true. Is that you know. And that's one of the reasons why I personally made that transition from the print industry into the online industry. Uh, HubSpot was just some, it was another company that was in that space, but my 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 drive was to move from that industry. Why? Because it no longer worked for people. As Tommy referred there a minute ago, that 90% of the purchasing decision is made before anybody speaks to a salesperson. That is so, so true. People go online, they go into Google or whatever search engine they prefer, and they put in a keyword. What's not changed is that they had a problem to solve in the first place, and it's about helping them to solve their problems. In days gone past, they used to go to the likes of Yellow Pages, or they would ask their mother. Nowadays, they go into Google. They put in that keyword search, and up comes a solution to that problem. Um, where inbound marketing works is to try and keep those companies who can solve that problem at the forefront of the person who's looking to solve it. Because when they're researching, they're not ready to make a purchasing decision, but they still have to solve their problem. So they want to go in and find a solution provider so that when they are ready to solve that problem and make that purchasing decision, your company who provides that service, who will solve that problem, is the company that's going to be front of mind. The slide that we're looking at here is really a testament to exactly what's happening there. We've got the likes of Netflix now. We've got the likes of Amazon to buy your books and your, your audio tapes. You can order a taxi off Uber. You're, you're going to check out a review on TripAdvisor before you book that hotel. All those guys are here today because people aren't looking for, for taxis uh, by standing on the side of the street anymore. They're not going to buy a newspaper and get print all over their fingers. Those days are gone. The day that's here in front of us and the opportunity for, for your companies and our companies to go international is to put your brand in front of the customer when they're looking to solve that problem. Great, Sharon. Um, I just want to show this slide. This is, uh, you know, I was talking about interruption marketing before, and that's basically um, you know, that the old days of spam emails, cold calling, advertising, et cetera. And when we talk about inbound marketing, we're talking about um, earning attention organically, attracting the attention of prospects via content creation, uh, using blogs, downloadable materials, videos, um, et cetera. People don't like to be interrupted. There's uh, some clever dudes out there who come up with caller ID. So, you know, when you see the mother-in-law phoning you, you don't have to answer the phone. When you're watching the television, you can fast forward the ads. Those kind of interruptive based solution providers, there isn't a place for them here anymore. So what we want to help do and what inbound marketing helps people do is put your brand in front of people when they want to be interrupted, not when you want to interrupt them. It's when they come to you. I suppose it's a bit of an opt-in. 
it's a permission base. They've said they have a problem. They want to find a solution <coughs> provider. They don't want your brand pushed in front of their face. They want to make sure that they're researching in their own time, whether it's sitting on the couch on a Friday night or it's sitting on the train uh, on their way home from work. They'll do it in their own time, in their own way, at their own pace. That enables you, the, the, the company, to pull these people in because they're interested in what you do because they have that problem to, sell, to, to solve. Then, when they are ready to make that purchasing decision, they've had a good user experience, they haven't been spammed, they haven't been bombarded, and they're ready to have that experience with you. This is some uh, a slide that we've shown to, to many times in our webinars before. Uh, we won't get into this now, but but Sharon, uh, one more comment from you on, on this end here, um, or question. When you look at the inbound marketing methodology, methodology, do you do, is there a difference between using that on a local basis, or then uh, you know using it to expand into new markets? How do you, how do you see that? Well, fundamentally, no, but kind of yes. I don't know that doesn't answer your question, but fu fundamentally, what you're looking to do is you want to attract the right types of strangers into your website in the first place. And whether those, those strangers are based in Helsinki or whether those strangers are based in Dublin or whether those strangers are based in Dubai, it's the fact that they have that problem. I mean, if you want to take your business internationally, it's about peeling your, your, your understanding of your buyer behavior right back to the core. Who are these guys? What is their problem? What solution can I provide to them? You want to attract the right types of strangers into your website in the first place. Then you're going to put into place tactics and techniques that will then nurture them all the way through until they're ready to make that purchasing decision. So the opportunity for you to take your company and your brand international is that you're still solving that problem. You want to make your, your content relevant, you want to make it interesting, and you want to get in front of, I suppose, your prospect at the right time with the right content so that you build that brand awareness of them on an international stage or a local stage if you prefer to stay local. But the opportunity to go international with inbound is massive because your now window, your shopping window for your prospects has now expanded so much. One of the things that uh, I know that you and I have spoken about before is, is that um, actually it's a great time to think about going international for small and medium sized companies because the technology is actually there to to, to leverage and make it possible without huge um, investments into outbound marketing or, or uh, infrastructure, et cetera. Um, this slide shows uh, pretty much the reality for many companies. They have uh, what we call a Frankenstein uh, phenomena where they've, they've, they, they need to use tons of different kinds of software and tools to manage this, uh, this uh, you know, inbound funnel. Um, how often do you see that, Sharon, in your, in your work? There's lots of service providers out there, Tommy. They all do a good job. Um, they wouldn't be there. They wouldn't be the companies that have survived over the last 10 years if they didn't do a good job. Um, yes, you're right. You know, the fact that the internet exists means that we have that international window of opportunity, and we have the ability to get out there and talk to marketplaces that would never have heard of us in the first place. They still have that problem. They possibly would go elsewhere, but now we can actually, using tools like this, get their brand out there in, in front of the prospect company. The difference is, is that there's lots of different brands or different um, tools there, as you say. It is a bit of a Frankenstein, you know, let's, let's, let's do a little bit here from email marketing. Let's do a little bit there for creating brand awareness with blog posts. Let's do a little bit there with something like Google Analytics. As I said, all good tools in their own right, but lots of dispar disparate tools. That causes a lot of work for you, the small to medium business, to do, because you're cobbling together tons and tons of different reports so that you can make intelligent marketing decisions by understanding what you're doing. So the tools are good. The Frankenstein approach is probably causing time inefficiencies and less streamlined business practices. Here's a, here's a nice figure. The average cost to generate a lead through inbound marketing is, is approximately, and this was a few years back, $143 versus about half the average for outbound marketing, uh, 373 So the question is, I think the big one is, is the change in buying behavior good news for the international marketer? And the uh, resounding answer for me is, is yes, there's never been a better time to go, to go international. Um, 
and having said that, nevertheless, for every successful you know market entry, about four fail. So it is it is risk prone, uh, but there are very good reasons to go international now. New competition is entering your space as we speak, uh, regardless of the market. They're coming uh, probably via the internet first. Uh, physical proximity is not as critical as before, and going international is less dependent on, as I mentioned before, expensive outbound uh, tactics and um, investments. Plus, I think a big one, and I think that Yuka is probably going to talk talk about this uh, to a degree, is that going international requires uh, maybe less feet on the ground compared to the old days. Um, at least uh, when you're entering the market, you can try to do that via the internet and save, you know, go with less risk as you enter the market. Um, getting into Google and generating leads via the internet is is um, an efficient way to think about it. But Nordic ID, Yuka, let's let's get into what you guys do. What's uh, what's at the heart of your business? What do you do? Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> sorry about my voice. It's a bit low, low today. But anyway, uh, hope it doesn't matter. So we are we are doing this RFID readers and and software. So what is that? As an example, so retail, for instance, they are using RFID in increasing amounts in the shop floors to tag uh, different clothes, for instance. And, and with area readers, for instance, then they know exactly where are the, the clothes at, at, at which point. Uh, one problem in retail, for instance, is that uh, I come to a shop, I want Levi's jeans, 501 uh, size 32, waist length 30, and they can't find it. They think they are out of stock. Actually, they are not. Uh, if they would have the RFID readers, and tags in, in each of the jeans, which actually they do more and more Levi's does that. So then they know if the jeans are, if they are in the in their uh, backroom stock uh, storage, or if they are in their fitting rooms, or even in the dwelling area, which is between the fitting room and the shop. Also inventory can be done much faster. This is just one example. So of course in logistics, manufacturing, automotive, healthcare, Textile rental, there are also numerous numerous applications as, as well. So you you had the marketing and sales. How how have you set up your you know operations? What, yeah. What did the teams look like? Yeah, the the company was already established 1986, and it went international in early 1990s. Uh, at the moment, we have 14 persons in in sales and marketing. Three of them are marketing uh, people. We have our own. Um, Graphical designer also. Uh, one of these is a, is a product manager, technical product manager, which of course is, is needed to give, uh, for instance, training to our partners. We have a repair network, service network in different countries around the world. And then my, my sales team, sales managers, they are spread uh, around the world in that sense that we have guys there in UK, the Netherlands, uh, Brussels, and and then uh, Germany, where we have also uh, our own, you know, company, sister company, GmbH, as they call it in in Germany, with the managing director and seven persons there. So yeah, we have we have sales people around the world. So when you when you think of your teams that you have around the world, how much deviation do you have locally? I mean, that's an important question going international. Um, how much how much local cultural deviation? Uh, well, of course, you know, uh, Germans are more like uh, hierarchical. Um, they might not read emails coming from females. You know, <laughs> maybe maybe it's not so 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 black and white. But there are of course cultural differences. Yes. What's working and what's not? What do you what do you see as the uh, um, sort of mix at the moment? Well, all my all my sales managers and of course marketing, uh, they understand the importance of, of inbound marketing and the usage of social media. They are more and more sharing our good case studies. We do blog every week, either ourselves or then, it's a, then it is a guest blog, can be that as well. We do press releases whenever we can and uh, we are very active in, in social media. We just got a very good lead and, and we have made an offer and I think we are going to close that deal as well just by so that i was looking for a new area sales manager for finland and scandinavia so one of my 
sales manager shared that in in her personal LinkedIn profile, and and then this particular company found found us that way. Wow! So it's really important to share these good news and blogs in in each and everybody, each, each and every employee's uh, own personal accounts, whether it's LinkedIn or or you know even Instagram, Facebook, and and of course Twitter. Now, when we think of um, you know digitalization, IoT, mm. um, we think of inbound marketing. Uh, it's change management. How how have you gotten your people on board to understand the meaning of of of, for example, content marketing and social media? What what, what did you have to do? Yeah, of course, new people. It's easier to control so that I don't employ people, for instance, whose LinkedIn profile is not in good shape. So I I don't I'm, I don't employ those kind of people to my team because they they have to and i check this when i do the job interview that whether they are actively and of course i can check it myself whether they are active in social media or not and whether they understand what is this this inbound and and marketing automation we have a tool for that and and we do twitters every every couple of hours tweets you know so uh, sounds good sharon did you have a point there I just going to agree there. We do the same when we're, we're when we're screening for candidates for employment. We check out their LinkedIn profile and their digital footprint. It's really really important to us. Mm-hmm. Yuka, how how have you noticed sort of the you know we were talking about the, the changes in mm-hmm. buying behavior before. How have you noticed changes in buying behavior? Um, you know things that you were doing ten years ago um, probably would not work yes, today. Yes, yes. Yeah yeah exactly. I mean this cold calling. We still do some, like in UK, we are we are going to do a campaign on on one of our products, um, and we are we are going to do a cold calling campaign uh, with with an with an agency that we have used before, but we don't do that uh, a lot at all. So um, I mean, our web page is of course there and in in an excellent shape, and and we have extranet there for for our you know, repair network and, and for ours, whether it's a system integrator, whether it's a reseller, distributor. Um, so we have we have own own paths for those those different different kind of partners in our extranet and, and it's easy to find uh, information there online. Um, and of course all of our sales meetings and, and stuff like that we use a lot of Skype calling and uh, also with, with, with customers um and uh we do even you know email email campaigns but so that we know whoever opens that email so then we can call him or her and and we know that uh, this person is interested in our messages in our solutions okay there was an interesting question there just uh, popped up a while ago um what kind of how have your metrics changed what you measure um in terms of sales and marketing have the, what kind of kpis are you looking at of course, sales. I mean, numbers matter. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. numbers matter. So, it's it's sales managers. They need to do their sales. But that's why you know marketing is under sales, so that each and every marketing person understands that their main purpose is to create leads for sales and to sell more, to to uh, facilitate sales. So they they definitely understand. Everybody in marketing they understand that. And I want to control what they do, that they do meaningful stuff that is really creating more leads to sales. That's very important. Grow sales, reach new markets, new customers. Um, what are the sort of the industry specific challenges that you can find in your in your business? Yeah, it's it's very important to employ right kind of people, especially abroad when they are further away from the headquarters. So our headquarters is in Salo, Finland. We have also Turku and Helsinki offices, but uh, when we recruit abroad, like now we are looking for a new sales manager for UK, it's very important that it's the right kind of person. We, we need to trust him or her, and, and this person needs to be very active. And also, he or she needs to understand this, this social media usage and, and inbound marketing, because... It, it helps our, our job so so much. We, we save money with that. We reach a much uh, broader audience globally. We, we are selling to Asia. We are selling to US. We are selling to Latin America and, of course, Europe. So, I mean, we, we need to reach everybody. And, and we cannot. If we would fly to each of these locations, we would go bankrupt very soon. 
Sharon, you work with companies um, across Europe um, on a daily basis. How familiar does this sound? Absolutely. I, if you had a camera on here, you'd see a big smile on my face, Yuka. So thanks for sharing that. Tommy is correct. I mean, our international office is based in Dublin. Our head office is based in Boston. We have a new office in Singapore, and we're about to open another office in, in Tokyo in Q4 of 2016. I spend all day talking to people internationally. I mean, here am I in Dublin at this moment in time, talking to you guys in Helsinki. Um, my next call is in about 50 minutes, and that will be in the Netherlands. Earlier on today, I was in Kuwait. So from an international perspective, we're on a go-to meeting here at this moment in time. The world is a tiny place now because of the, the advent of the internet. So the opportunity to go and capture that international market is absolutely huge because technology has enabled us to do this. And it's up to us, the savvy businesses, to grab that opportunity and run with it. Okay, thanks. Uh, Yuka, one more question. What do you think you're going to be doing differently in, in, in the next few? I know this is hard, but, but what, what things will change? What do you foresee? Uh well, we I, I know that we are we are on the growth path, so so we are growing, so we are yeah getting more people on board, and and I think in inevitably this all this you know new marketing means of doing marketing, new means of doing marketing that that also means and and sales growth and stuff like that you know focusing on the on the meaningful matters that also might change that I need to change some personnel that I currently have so those those decisions they will be hard but uh, if I don't do them somebody will change me so I have to do it I mean it's part of my job so this this of course I see so very important point the, the yeah. competences are changing yeah yeah exactly yes so yes, you have yes, to think about yes, that yeah, as yeah, you recruit yeah, people yeah, true true okay we're going to get into Yuka's key challenges with succeeding and going international the main points that you sort of outlined there and you've got as number one um, how to find the right partners distributors resellers Yes. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, we of course we are we are selling also somewhat uh, directly to to end customers, but more much more we are selling through our reseller, distributor, uh, and system integrator network. Um, we are doing the readers. We are doing the software for them. We are doing even in some cases ERP or point of sales. Uh, integrations but we don't for instance do the tags that are in the in the items that that then are read with the rfid readers so uh you know and those those players tag manufacturers they they many times they have user interface also for the reader like for the for the retail retail or specific uh, logistics or manufacturing solution so uh you know so we we, we need different kind of partners and and of course there are a lot of them available so we need to be very picky so that we really choose the right partners that are interested in us and not just using us to as a kind of a racehorse to press down our you know competitors prices so and also we need to then train them and and of course in in, in that job this you know all these uh, social media and, and, and this internet, it's very helpful. So your number two point is, is picking the right market. That's also very important, yes. We, we cannot at the moment, of course, and, and always, whether, whether we would be big or small company, we have to choose the right markets, also the right, um, right industry sectors. So are we going to grow in France or are we going to grow in Colombia or or is it Japan or Australia? Or which which country it is? So that that we are we are daily on daily basis, of course, thinking about that. But we need to be coherent. If if we choose France, we need to try that. It is it doesn't happen overnight. So we need to have a solid strategy. You know, France. Let's try it one or two years. You know, if it doesn't work, that then 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 we drop it. But we need to give it more than a couple of months. How much do you use the internet? Like reach out via LinkedIn to, to different contacts or so forth? Uh, yeah, of course, we, we use it a lot. I mean, I mean, we use it a lot. And there you have it, vital to employ the right people, especially when they are so far away. Mm, and uh, that's, that's something that you mm. spoke about for. Let's go to your final point here. Choose the best and most applicable trade fairs to participate. Mm. So what you do is you use a combination of inbound tactics and outbound tactics. Yeah. Trade fairs, these are very important in your business too. 
Yes, I was just last year in last last uh, week in New York in, in National Retail Fair, and and we noticed the two main topics there were RFID and uh, analytics. So uh, it's really happening now this RFID in in US, and of course that was um, concentrated around uh, retail. You know, all the big uh, retailers were there, all the big software companies were there. So next year we will have a booth also there. But then we are participating in numerous industry fairs around Europe. We will be next week in Dusseldorf. We have a booth in Eurosis. Uh, we are going to RBT in London. We are going to Logimat in Germany. We are organizing our own roundtable event in, in Germany with around 100, 100 visitors, uh, our main partners and uh, customers. So yeah, that, those those trade fairs to reach the right audience, to make our brand name more visible and and more well known, those are also very important. And the follow up to do the follow up, then, then um, you know, in a diligent way, that's very important. So would you say that uh, in your sort of success um, recipe, you use a combination of of some good inbound? And then some good uh, traditional outbound tactics as well. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, for instance, trade fairs, we use a lot of inbound to make our audience known that we are participating in this trade fair and, and you know, welcoming them to visit our booth. A few comments on Yuka's points there. What did you think? Yeah, I, I think um, the fact that you're using your social media and you're using your LinkedIn uh, to go internationally with your with your brand and with your services and also that you're using the digital arena to uh, to do your to look after your recruitment i think juxtaposing it with your with your outbound with the, with the trade fairs if that's important to your business well then you know then that's a good idea i mean the face to face the one on one uh, one of the reasons why hubspot you know works with um agencies such as sales communications is to keep close to that local market to keep listening to the customers working with both inbound and working it with outbound as well the combination can lead to a very very powerful product proposition very very powerful company proposition to attract those customers who are looking to solve that problem that they were looking for in the first place um, it keeps you it keeps you fresh it keeps you interesting it keeps you relevant again it's not interrupting the people going to the trade fairs have chosen to go there and um, the people who have clicked on your blog post on your call to action on your website have chosen to go there so again working together working in combination to stay relevant just not be interruptive not be pushy not be spammy but keep your brand keep your company on that international stage and really really accelerate your expansion plans yeah so, yeah that's exactly correct Sharon Sharon one uh, question we're running out of time here but uh, you know what do you think about this whole debate of inbound versus outbound is that it, it's almost like a religious question <laughs> Isn't and it's it? also kind of like, gosh, if I, if I endorse outbound, will I get fired? <laughs> <laughs> no, look, as I said there, you know, there is a place for both. I yeah. mean, certainly I would always recommend as well, if you're starting with inbound and you already do outbound, run the two together because the, the key thing with inbound is it's not about adding water and expecting to have seven times. Sorry, I'll rephrase that. It's not about adding water on a Friday and expecting to have seven times more traffic into your website by Monday. Inbound marketing takes time to build up. It takes time to create those links. It takes time for the internet and all that magic stuff that goes on in the WWW world. It takes time for all that to, to take legs. And that's why, as I said, again, working with local partners to use their expertise to make it happen. If you're already using outbound, you know, continue to do that uh, so that you're supporting and supplementing your new inbound activities. The great thing about working on something like inbound is that you can very categorically measure the results of the marketing activities you do. Everything has a number, and Yoko referred to that earlier on, you know, um, in relation to sales and marketing, what, what's kingpin? The numbers are kingpin. And when you have visibility and accuracy over your numbers, then you can make those smart marketing decisions of, do I do more outbound or do I do more inbound? What do I drop? What do I add more to? Because you have the data in front of you to prove out the marketing activities that you've engaged in. 
Does that thank answer you. your question, Tommy? Absolutely. Thank you, Sharon, so much. And thank you, Yuka. Uh, we're out of time now, um, but I hope that uh, our attendees have gotten um, some good ideas on, on how to go international and what some of the key issues are. I've certainly enjoyed it. Um, I, I want to remind everybody that we do have a website that has uh, an English portion on it. It's uh, slash en, and we have some blogs that are uh, cover the topic pretty well, and like I mentioned before, a good ebook that really covers the, the topic of going international with inbound marketing. Our next webinar is going to be um, at 1400 hours finish time next Wednesday, 3rd of February, and HubSpot as a website publishing platform is the topic with your hosts, Yanni Altonen and also uh, Yoni Laukkonen. And uh, I just want to thank you all. You'll receive a short questionnaire in a moment. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.